Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fourth installment of Preservation Connecticut's Fall 2021 series, Talking About Preservation, our noontime chats about everything preservation. I'm Jane Montanaro, Executive Director of Preservation Connecticut, and I'm happy to be your host today as we chat with David Namek, military historian on the uncovering of the Battle of Ridgefield. Many of you are new participants to our programming today, so I'd like to take a minute to share with you some information about Preservation Connecticut. Preservation Connecticut is the statewide private nonprofit historic preservation organization founded in 1975 by a special act of the Connecticut General Assembly as the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation to preserve, protect, and promote the buildings, sites, and landscapes that contribute to the heritage and vitality of Connecticut's communities. We are statutory partners with the State Historic Preservation Office, and I am proud to say that for over four decades, we have successfully championed the protection of remarkable community assets all over the state by leveraging funding, advocating, forming partnerships, and promoting stewardship. And we are a membership organization, and I encourage you all to become members and join us um, in our coalition to protect historic properties in Connecticut. Our office is on Whitney Avenue in Hamden, Connecticut, listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Shown here, it's the Eli Whitney boarding house built in 1827 to house workers for Eli Whitney's gun factory. And it has served as Preservation Connecticut's headquarters since 1989. We have a staff of eight preservation professionals and a board of 21 preservationists from around the state. Our staff listed here are always available to assist with inquiries. Chris, Regren, Chris, Chris Wegren is our deputy director Contact Chris for information on historic preservation easements, our bi-monthly magazine, Connecticut Preservation News, our newly launched Olmsted and Connecticut Landscape Survey Project, or to arrange book talks for his recently published book, Connecticut Architecture, Stories of 100 Places. Renee Trebert, Making Places and Preservation Services Manager, Please contact Renee for information on redevelopment of historic industrial mill sites and tax credit applications. Jordan Sorensen is our development and special projects manager. Jordan manages our communications and outreach to members through social media and email, receives and monitors demolition notices from municipalities and prepares historic tax credit applications and nominations to state and national register of historic places. Kristen Hopewood, Development Assistant, manages all of the inquiries that come through our website, provides member services, arranges special events, and is the editor of our Historic Properties Exchange, a free listing of threatened historic properties. And finally, our team of circuit riders, Brad Scheid, Mike Farino, and Stacey Vero, provide immediate response to homeowners, developers, municipal leaders, nonprofit organizations, and museums historic district commissions, and more with an array of preservation technical assistance, including community organizing, prioritizing maintenance and repairs, historic designations, and funding. These weekly chats have served as a meaningful way for us to continue our mission during the pandemic. We've been able to connect with the public and hear what's on your mind. Please feel free to use the chat feature ask questions directly at the end of the presentation or contact us afterwards for a call or a site visit. So with that, I'm very excited to turn our attention to our guest today, Dave Nomek, Heritage Consulting. Dave, it's wonderful to have you. And I will Having take down my, I'll stop sharing so you can have the, slot, have the, the platform. All right, well, thank you, Jane. I guess it's it's over to me now, and I hope I'm broadcast, broadcasting loud and clear. If you can't hear me, I suppose to the chat option, somehow um, you know, contact the administrators here, but hopefully I'm loud and clear. So I'd like to thank uh, Preservation Connecticut for the opportunity um, to chat and share this exciting project that the Ridgefield Historical Society has been 
engaged in for some time, but at least since the beginning of this year, 2021, uh, Heritage Consultants, uh, myself, along with Dr. Kevin McBride from the University of Connecticut, and David George uh, is one of the lead investigators as well from Heritage Consultants. We've been working on what's uh, known as a National Park Service American Battlefield Protection Program grant. And if you aren't familiar with that program, it's very exciting, very interesting um, mode of uh, and tool for historical preservation as much like Preservation Connecticut, uh, the American Battlefield Protection Program is designed for that sort of protection, preservation, promoting awareness for endangered, threatened battlefields on American soil and territories as well, thinking, you know, in the war in the Pacific and onwards and so forth. So for, uh, I don't know how many decades, this program has been um, a grant, I mean, a um, actually a congressionally funded project sort of separated within the National Park Service, which is interesting. And initially it was there really these monies designed to um, assist threaten American Civil War, Revolutionary War battlefields, and that had been then expanded out of the War of 1812, and then onto essentially any, any uh, conflict between um, uh, uh, basically political entities in which um, sovereign nations in which uh, blood was spilled. So with that said, um, years ago, uh, not that many years ago, but um, well, yeah, many years ago, actually, for about a decade now, myself and Dr. Kevin McBride have been involved in these ABPP grants uh, during our, our time with the uh, Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center. So uh, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer at the time, Kathleen Knowles of the Pequot Tribe, found out about this program and thought, why would these funds, why would this research not uh, apply to threatened Pequot war battlefields, which there are several here in Connecticut and even in Rhode Island. Um, so with that said, we, we applied and that was one of the earliest projects funded by this program, a 17th century battlefield. And until that time, it wasn't thought that A, there was probably anything to study left of the Pequot War and could there be anything in Mystic or Fairfield still left to research artifacts to uncover? Is there any intact land? And uh, through our subsequent research from about 2007 onwards, we had found that's the, that's the case. So um, since then, Dr. McBride and myself have worked on, uh, I don't know how many Pequot War battlefields, not to mention King Philip's War battlefields in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, that's 1675 to 76 in our region. Then uh, War of 1812 projects, the uh, burning of uh, Essex, Connecticut in 1814, and the attack on um, Stonington Borough in 1814 as well. And we were very excited through Heritage Consultants, uh, who we're now affiliated with, to apply for and receive you know, this project subcontracted to the Ridgefield Historical Society. So the National Park Service ABPP program funds three phases of, of, of grant funding um, upwards to, I don't know, $150,000, $60,000 for some projects. But the uh, program is uh, split into a first phase, which Ridgefield is, is engaged in what we're going to talk about today, which is the research phase to reconstruct with all available sources uh, the extent of the engagement, in this case, the Battle of Ridgefield on specifically April 27th, 1777. I mean, we'll be talking about the entire Danbury expedition, raid right on Danbury, but specifically Ridgefield is studying what occurred on the 27th, essentially, you know, within the town borders. So any project that has a phase one, the research is conducted to see where actions occurred and what areas contribute to the battlefield. Um, that includes like campsites, hospitals, fortifications, even if combat didn't play, take place there, those would be um, uh, ancillary properties or contributing properties. Um, and then wherever within the study area, this big kind of amorphous almost line you draw around where you believe combat occurred based on historical research and uh, existing archeological evidence, one determines, and Ridgefield's in the Ridgefield Historical and Heritage is in the process of determining 
how much of that land is still quote unquote in, intact or retains some degree of integrity um, in which the research can move on to a phase two, which would be actually ground truthing the research with um, archaeology, with uh, remote sensing, uh, which quote unquote, you know, breaks down into essentially metal detecting. And, you know, if it's the right conditions, perhaps ground penetrating radar, some limited shovel test piston, uh, uh, shovel uh, uh, test pitting, uh, STPs, which are designed to, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a particularly hot area, high density of artifacts to uh, to find the non-metallic objects, right? Gun flints and, you know, kaolin pipes and whatnot, but also to determine the stratigraphy of the soil and it helps you really quick figure out how intact that lawn is or is not. So in any case, the, the phase two is the archeology. span So phase one is research to determine the bounds of the engagement, what might be intact or not. Um, importantly, I should add, uh, to obtain a critical mass, quote unquote, of uh, landholder permissions. And that's kind of subjective, but the more landholder permissions a institution, an entity, uh, can obtain to show that sort of, to show landholder buy-in, to show that there's multiple stakeholders that are supporting this project, better chance of phase two. And you know, happy to say Ridgefield Historical is really going above and beyond and kind of ahead of the game in terms of acquiring permissions. Uh, so much so that uh, their members and informants, let's say, and friends are also uh, sharing, you know, information if there's construction going on at an interesting site or, you know, perhaps if a landholder is going to sell their property, they offer uh, the land for a quick survey, you know, we'll take the opportunity now um, because there's a chance we might not be able to in the future. So that's, that's part of all of this. Um, so phase one is the research, what's intact, what's not, landholder permission. Phase two, which Ridgefield will be applying for, if, if not already in the process, is the um, essentially the archaeology phase. I, I forget the exact term, um, the technical term of the grant, but you are now at this point, again, ground truthing those properties that have been identified as potentially contributing to the battle in terms of in terms of archaeological uh, evidence. So what the Park Service really wants out of a phase two is yes, some evidence in terms of battle related objects. We'll talk more about what that consists of and I'll, I should have some images to share with you. Um, so yeah, in terms of battle related objects and uh, figuring out sort of me uh, uh, meets and bounds, let's say of the engagement, like the extent of combat. It's, it's well known in Richfield and if among some of you, I. I see here today a lot of familiar friends and faces, so thanks for joining. Those of you that know the battle or Western Connecticut, it's, it's often broken down into three main engagements. You drive through town today, whether it's, I guess, depending on what direction you come through the center of town or south along North Salem Road, you'll you'll see those historical markers that have been up some, for some time. So um, uh, we are essentially in a phase two going to be studying, uh, you know, the entire battle beyond even those three major engagements. So this, and then uh, essentially to, without belaboring things and rattling on too much, the phase three, uh, which I'm currently working with Fairfield Museum and Historical Center down south. Um, and I have worked with in the past and Kevin as well at Old Saybrook and other sites. Phase three is an educational component, which is really interesting and great. Um, that the Park Service offers this. Uh, at the end of the phase two, not only do they want you, again, through artifacts to determine if those properties contribute to the battle, where the battle spreads to, beyond, in our case, the three major, three major engagements, but they are also hoping that there will be properties added, uh, submitted to the National Historical Register, not due to their, well, in our case, perhaps due to their architecture, if that building is standing at the time of the battle, number of those buildings are already on the register. Or if one's lawn has cannonballs, musket balls, evidence of combat, and, you know, can also um, contribute to this overall battlefield landscape, that too would 
qualify in this case, the property for um, inclusion on the National Historical Register. Um, and one way they do this is through this sort of, um, uh, sort of, in, in, it's a connected sort of battlefield district, let's say, in, in which the contributing properties are um, connected in this long and sometimes amorphous um, amoeba looking sort of district. But it's again, based on what properties contribute, what don't, what landholders you know, would want to participate in the National Register or not kind of stuff. Um, the immediately, before getting into the phase three, some of the questions we get immediately if we do have landholders here who, who do want to participate, um, you know, is, you know, is there any restrictions put on one's property um, as a result of this sort of research or participation? No. If objects are found on your property that are battle related, a couple musket balls, buttons, buckles, as a condition of, you know, uh, participating and as written out on the landholder permissions, the Park Service expects those objects to become property of the Park Service, which is different than a, a typical practice here in Connecticut, most New England states. Landholder is the owner of objects found on their property, generally. Um, in this case, it will go turn over the Park Service uh, under the care of, um, in this case, Ridgefield Historical Society. The Park Service doesn't want to see 100 different individual parcels of artifacts lost in space or sold or, for, or forgotten. They want them curated together for the integrity of that collection and you know to tell the story and future research and they would like it kept locally and the you know the institution has to meet a bunch of standards which Ridgefield Historical does. Okay so um, anything not battle related you know whatever um, other early American tools, artifacts, buttons, you know, matchbox cars, coins, whatever it stays with the landholder. Unfortunately that's a lot of junk too nails and things like that. If taken um you know and recovered generally almost anything that is taken and recovered for further research that becomes part of this collection um whether it's deemed in the future not to be battle related it still has an artifact id um uh, so onwards and so forth there's a lot to that the phase three again is interesting in terms of the educational component of the grant um, it, the Park Service will fund the development of historical market markers and signage, but not the installation of. So right now, Fairfield Historical is working on creating signage for the final battle of the Pequot War in 1637, the Battle of Monocomic Swamp or Pequot Swamp. So, uh, Saybrook already has six historical markers installed around town, and you can find more info on their website. They've turned it into a walking tour, a bicycle tour. There's maps you can download. It's, they've really gotten a lot of historical tourism mileage out of that project. It can also be used for exhibit development, again, but not fabrication. Um, some publications, I think Old Saybrook published a book. And there's a bunch of different options. So it's a really fascinating program that has been continually supported by and funded by Congress, you know, even through the ups and downs and recession and, you know, senators, you know, crying poverty for decades, the program's always been supported. So it's, it's interesting. And I'm, I'm glad there's, you know, one of several Revolutionary War sites in Connecticut now being investigated. So, so here we are after that long, you know, drawn out background about the program. I'll talk a little bit about research we've conducted since the beginning of 2021. And there has, in addition to great local histories in Ridgefield and earlier 20th century materials, late you know, 19th century materials, there's been several really recent years, great uh, books published on the subject. I think I see one of our authors here today and or was signed up at least. And um, uh, we are in our consortium, you know, working with people that have studied this. So the different contemporary books already that, that have been put out on the subject, um, study the overall Danbury expedition in different degrees with different focuses, um, all contributing to this larger, you know, 
knowledge we have of, of, of the overall battle, Ridgefield Historical Society's um, purpose of the grant, again, is focused specifically in town, uh, which is enough to keep us busy because there's been quite a bit of combat that's taken place in Ridgefield during this battle, even more so um, than, you know, has been detailed in years past. So for us, the Heritage Consultants, starting right off with any of these projects, it's kind of multi-tiered. We have some individuals working on gathering maps, both historical, contemporary, GIS maps as well, uh, global you know, information systems, digital components in which we can overlay the modern landscape and uh, you know, tax maps, property boundaries with historical maps and and um, you know, just seeing change over time. I mean, clearly that's important. And an outcome Ridgefield wants is us to also reconstruct the landscape as best as possible as it existed back then. And we're having some good success in terms of houses, lots, fences versus walls, bridges that may have been there at the time, discontinued roads, things like that. Uh, we have um, Mr. Uh, William Keegan, Bill Keegan. Many of you probably familiar with Bill, working on that. And um, it's great having, you know, so many different members of this team to you know, work on this project. With that said, Kevin McBride is, is working a lot, again, with myself and Dave George in documenting and mapping um, any contemporary <clears throat> archaeological finds that are found either in the course of our, our few surveys or, or others in town. We have Ridgefield, through their outreach on social media and elsewhere, have connected with uh, local um, detectorists who have access to some properties in town already that they've been working on in past years, and, and they have been kind enough to share their collections with us. And um, with that said, I'll you know, talk more about or share our, our databases that we've, we've built thus far. Um, we are, Kevin and myself, trying to gather as much primary source documentation as possible. Luckily, and surprisingly, um, and I only say surprisingly because we've done this project for like a decade now, working with multiple historical societies, but Ridgefield, as they should be proud of, is the first one that had quite a bit of very relevant materials in their archives, thanks in part to these authors that have done research in the past, um, uh, large in part also, uh, Damian Douglas and his uh, Bridge Not Taken um, book back in, I think, what about 2002, first time that came out. Uh, he's since passed. His, his wife has, our uh, widow has shared his, his papers, which contain, you know, let's say maybe a quarter of our research already is not an exaggeration and put us on, you know, proper direction, saved us a lot of time. Um, Ridgefield's also been very engaged in reaching out to the community, as mentioned, to see if anyone has any finds they remember over the year, from cannonballs to but buttons to muskets, and a surprising amount of material has uh, materialized, which, again, um, Kevin is keeping track of. I'll show you some initial findings. Um, not to mention, you know, in addition to looking at you know, the state records, federal records, local town records, uh, very importantly, federal pension records by Revolutionary War veterans. Um, I might as well just discuss, you know, some of our different sources that have proved fruitful at this time. The pensions have been quite useful as um, all of the authors from, you know, Douglas to um, Stephen Darley, Call to Arms, and of course, uh, Keith Marshall Jones, uh, Farmers Against the Crown. Uh, they've relied quite a bit on pension records, have been very interested in reconstructing rosters, the extent of the individual soldiers there, which is a lifetime of work. And I'm really, you know, we are all heritage really indebted to the research that's been done already. Like why reinvent the wheel? We are trying to, of course, in addition to collecting all the primary stuff, scouring the secondaries to see what, you know, great materials these, these, you know, authors have uncovered in the past. Ridgefield has been working on, um, and, and Heritage, working with Ridgefield, developing volunteer and intern projects, let's say, for the many enthusiastic people in town and in the society that want to help out. And uh, in lieu of doing, you know, research right in the archives, we've been able to access uh, digitally at least these pension records that are so useful. So a number of volunteers have been using names listed in 
know, Mr. Darley's book and, you know, Mr. Jones's book and elsewhere, getting, I've been accumulating digital copies of all of any existing uh, pensions from these many soldiers listed in these other volumes. They are also the researchers doing this and volunteers have a genealogical interest and background. So they are able to read through the documents. We've put together a database of important info they should pull out. And, and uh, although at first I, I believe the volunteers were under the impression they weren't finding too much because it's like a sentence here, a couple sentences there. I mean, you start compiling these tidbits of information and it, it adds quite a bit of detail in the grand schemes of this, this narrative we're trying to build. So there's been some great surprises there um, from descriptions of combat to officers, to placement of regiments that really helped us kind of reconstruct where units are probably located. I think since many of these authors, uh, the most recent research has been done is been more and more digitization it happens every week month day really and surprisingly quite a bit of british newspapers are now accessible uh that you know, i've happened to dive into and i found a great bit of research over about a month or two in british papers that i not really seen um cited elsewhere it's uh, it's always unfortunate to get super excited and then find out some you know like darley or jones have already found the stuff but in case of these papers it seems relatively new uh, what was interesting in the newspaper is there was some um, uh, different accounts of officers and men that were there, some elaboration on events, some elaboration on wounded officers, and not caring so much about the enlisted men, but some of these, these British newspapers are specifically talking about officers that are wounded and, and linking them to a specific brigade, uh, whether it's, uh, there's, there's two key British officers, Agnew and Erskine, that are in charge of most of the armed forces, even though General uh, Tryon is kind of you know, politically in charge of the overall force. And it's pretty clear through these, these records that distinctly, it's kind of commonsensical. Both these officers sort of split the overall force into these two brigades with equal number of regiments so they could operate independently. And that also helped add more detail to the various engagements and you know placement of troops and things like that and also the newspapers there were uh, several critical accounts british accounts critical of of uh, the british operations in, in the americas i think overall but really described surprisingly the danbury raid and fighting in ridgefield as as a lexington and concord which you know accomplished very little but incurred you know, significant casualties and and casualty, casualty, fig, casualty figures are ranging all over the place in the newspapers as well as the officers' reports. So, you know, it's kind of, it's always interesting to try to make heads or tails of any of this. But any, uh, also a, a number of these British newspapers, um, uh, in addition to describing the account as a Lexington and Concord, give additional details about fighting actually, you know, happening as soon as the troops left Danbury, British, that is and onto their march in Ridgefield and describing um, between the papers and some other manuscripts, you know, uh, you know, taking fire behind stone walls and trees and basically swamps and thickets. So it seems like there's quite a bit of pot shots being taken at these British troops and that increased until the breakout of essentially the first engagement. But through these papers and, you know, close readings of some of these existing manuscripts, it's also pretty clear that there was a New York militia on the scene pretty quickly. I've been working with a researcher who, I call him a researcher, he would call himself an enthusiast, but he's uh, out of Wilton, Connecticut, who is, I think, a Ridgefield Historical Society member at this point, but is at least on their mailing list. And he's done quite a bit of studying up on the confusion of the New York militias because apparently he had relatives serving there. So again, these uh, anyone interested in genealogy has, has proven to be quite useful in this, this study ultimately. So his New York research has really helped me unpack what regiments were there and where, and he has done pension work on these men. And just like yesterday, found a great account of, uh, I think I already got him confused, a third Westchester, Red, third regiment, Westchester militia, who claimed one private that they were basically on the outskirts of Danbury when the British marched out, but basically decided to like get out of their way. I mean, there's probably 40 of these guys versus 1800 British. So they backed up the entire way, uh, kind of kept in front of the troops. And according to British accounts, they're getting harassed in the rear as they march towards their 
their what's going to be their breakfast stop a few miles up and it can only be that westchester militia still trying to like kind of keep the pressure on so little details like that's interesting and would also be interesting during a phase two if one was able to perhaps sample some of the northern miles of the north salem road or even the george washington highway but of course you got overlapping sites you always got to think about the rochambeau route which <laughs> took that same uh march uh years later. So again, these are all questions to think about and where do you head your bets when it comes to doing a survey. Um, other findings that are interesting is um, I'm thinking archaeologically. Again, some of our uh, new friends, uh, local metal, metal detectorists will be working with us for here on out, having covered uh, identifiable buttons, both uh, continental, USA script, Loyalist buttons, which there's 300 loyalists in a brigade, you know, as part of these British forces, a number of which are Connecticut men who had remained loyal to the crown. And um, also, uh, what was of oh, an artillery button, which more than likely is a, a state of Connecticut artillery button. And there's been a lot of uh, enough debate in the historical record and accounts of whether Connecticut artillery and their colonel. Well, Continental Artillery under Colonel Lamb, who was stationed in New Haven, made it to the battle or not. But there's a button now on the scene, and it's, again, the uh, one of the big keys here will be the phase two archaeology. As, as Kevin and I always think, conceptualize these projects and say, uh, is like the archaeology is going to be, the, you know, the next, um, you know, big narrative, uh, the, uh, the last unknown narrative, where there's going to be a lot of things perhaps confirmed or, you know, denied or confused based on, you know, the artifacts that are found in the future. So right now we're still just trying to figure out where fighting took place, what land might contribute to, to um, you know, the, the battle and if the land is still intact. So that's the different things that are being um, balanced right now. Um, so the outcomes, I guess I'll just talk about outcomes and, um, I could discuss maybe a few more observations or just sort of open it up to questions without retelling the entire history of the Battle of Ridgefield. But uh, again, the outcomes shortly, uh, as I continue writing today and the rest of the week, is uh, a what's known as a, a technical report, which needs to be submitted showing uh, demonstrating to the Park Service are the methodologies employed, um, you know, the the sources used and a battle narrative, a new written narrative, heavily academic and cited um, in as much minutia as possible, detailing, you know, as much as we know about this battle. With, of course, historical context, so there's been a good amount of time involved having discussed, you know, the, you know, what you know, led to this invasion in 1777 and uh, preparations by the British and the landing of troops and the march up and you know authors you know you know ranging from all three of the authors have been very helpful in different degrees so we haven't had to spend as much time with the context as as the most important part for us the battle itself so have worked through the minutiae of the battle as much as we can you know include which would help us gain some insight into where actions occurred, to what extent, and um, also thinking about, again, if that land is intact, that's separate from the narrative, but the narrative helps, you know, um, you know, make that case. And then finally, this technical report, the core of it's this battlefield narrative, but you have the usual necessary chapters, again, of you know, why this is taking place and, you know, methods that will be employed, what's been done in the past, making the case of, of to what extent the this battlefield is threatened. I mean, that's key to the Park Service is if the whole battlefield is in, you know, open space and preserved to begin with, there's, and there's no threat to it, what's the point of funding a, a project? You know what happened there? Okay, you can learn more. It won't qualify, but if there is, you know, um, threats of 
residential or commercial construction or you know road construction whatever anything like that which is the case in Ridgefield I mean there's been a lot of building up over the past few years and it's in the lifetime of many residents in town so that's that's enough to to um to make the case but any of you that have no Ridgefield I mean there's there's a lot of intact ground out there there's a lot of uh, large lawns there's wooded areas there's open space along much of this battlefield route with the exception of let's say the center of town with that said i think one of the i'll call it a finding but i think anybody that's been studying this or writing about it has always realized that even though there's these three engagements um which long story short after the british um, are able to march into danbury burn danbury over the night of the 26th and the 27th they start marching out west along the present day George Washington Highway towards uh, Ridgeberry um, to then go south to Ridgefield. The Americans who have been massing and trying to get all their troops together at first thought Fairfield was going to be the target and when they realized the British had marched beyond them, uh, General Silliman and others are had then sort of um, gave chase, let's say. Eventually rendezvousing Reading and then Bethel and decided in, in, in a very during a very rainy evening and a forced march decided it wasn't a, a great idea to try to force Danbury you know that night they wouldn't be saving anything and probably most of their weaponry you know didn't work it was just soaked so American forces continued to gather around Danbury and quite a bit to the north to the south to the east now even apparently to the west with these New Yorkers so even though the British are surrounded I mean they're not outgunned and they still have the upper hand. The question is like, are they gonna go back south? The Americans at first were banking on that. I should say General Benedict Arnold is on the scene as well. General Worcester is the overall commander. Um, you got fourth brigade militia with Selman. There's a bunch of different commanders. Worcester makes the call to split his forces and the plan from the beginning always is to get a blocking force in the front of the British wherever they go and Worcester's division would hammer them in the rear, maybe get them in the sort of hammer and anvil kind of pincer movement. That, that was the plan. Um, it became evident in the morning, the British were not going back south, they were going west. So now the fear was they're gonna march all the way to Peekskill. The British had made a feint there a few days earlier with ships and troops to kind of throw the Americans off guard prior to this invasion. Upon reaching Ridgeberry and heading south, the Americans then realized that no, uh, the British are going back to the sound that changed plans completely. So Arnold and Silliman's division now goes west through Reading towards Ridgeberry, uh, Ridgefield. Uh, apparently getting to the center of town about an hour or so before the British arrive and they're able to start fortifying the, the entrance of town uh, right at the beginning of Main Street, north end of it. Other militia from other parts of the state are showing up and from Westchester County, the second Westchester are arriving down in Ridgefield. There's armed civilians that aren't in the militia formally. There's, we have a couple of counts in the state records of people seeking um, compensation or uh, you know, for medical bills afterwards that they just you know, grabbed their firearms and you know, fell in with every, anybody they could. Um, at Ridgefield, people are showing up without ammunition. So um, interesting local history, the first select men, um, select men, there's several of them, I guess, you know, basically open up the, the local magazine to the troops to just, you know, sort of start divvying out shot to everybody. So that, that was an important move. You know, luckily Ridgefield had some ammo and the, the selectmen, you know, opened it up to everybody that was there. Now, in the meantime, um, the British are taking fire, like as soon as they're on George Washington Road and they're getting a little jumpy and they split some of their troops up on side roads is, you know, to, to make sure nobody's going to attack their flanks. There's a local tradition um, from a couple sources that when the British arrive in Ridge Barry and near the church and decide to head south, there's a existing colonial house there. Kind of, you look, you'll spot it. You'd think it's a little newer, actually. Um, but the British uh, apparently took a few pistol shots at somebody in a window, which is interesting to us now because if they're taking fire the whole way from houses, outbuildings, swamps, and walls and fences, um, it's probably feasible that they're jumpy and they see somebody come to the window, they're, they're going to start taking shots at that person and 
shoot first, ask questions later. Pistols also indicate likely an officer or mounted troops like the Dragoons. That gives us some insight, these little stories. And that same um, oral tradition states that the British Dragoons or mounted troops were engaging some people closer to or taking shots at people on the New York border, not far away. It's like a mile and a half or two at most, basically. So that could be that the uh, third Westchester at this point. Uh, long story short, there's this, this scattered skirmishing. The British uh, head down, um, burn uh, Keeler's Mill, as it's known, as the, there were supplies stored there. Accounts state that there's also some brief skirmishing a little north of there. Not much, but probably those New Yorkers again. British rest near the intersection of Takora Trail and North Salem Road to, to eat. They haven't had any sort of meal yet. So they have uh, animals, uh, cattle, sheep, goats they, they have with them. They slaughter a few there to feed the troops. Whether they're able to do it or not, the standard British ration for a day is like a pound of beef. I don't know if they ate it all then or not, but there's a number of cattle slaughtered and there was some time spent there allowing Worcester's division to make up time and start to intercept along eventually what will be Barlow Mountain Road. So as the British then get their, their troops in order again, start moving out within that vicinity, probably both to Cora and North Salem, uh, their first brigade gets through, probably the second brigade gets through. I should mention there's three artillery pieces as well in each brigade, um, hand drawn, probably kind of small and mobile. And then in the rear was a number of wagons, uh, some of, somewhat of a wagon train, maybe extra ammo, the, um, anything um, taken from Danbury and the rest of the cattle. It's that tail end of the column, that wagon train, um, the, the guard that might be there and any wounded as well in the wagons and the Teamsters, those actually driving the wagons that are hit by Worcester's, Worcester's division and as they are able to engage the British rear of the column. They overtake all those wagons, take prisoners, number ranges, but I, I think the number discrepancy, which is every, anywhere from 40 to like seven, is based on, you know, British enlisted personnel, soldiers versus the Teamsters, which were probably civilians. Maybe, maybe they were British personnel, but if, if so, it throws all the numbers off that the British themselves account for. And it would make sense they wouldn't account for civilian personnel because they're civilian personnel. They may even have been men of color hired from New York. Who knows who these guys are? Wagons are taken. The British probably lose a good chunk of their reserve ammunition. So now they only have whatever they have on them and they most soldiers went into battle or went on the march with 60 rounds of ammo at, you know at least so in any case it's all they have that's known as the first engagement although it's a non-stop engagement from here on out to the south now at the north of uh you know the town center uh arnold Sullivan's division is fortifying across you know what's known as the Stebbins Stepin, property more or less where the marker is today there's regiments on either flanks in case the British try to force them. Worcester's men keep hammering the British till the British are able to make a stand, um, bringing up their artillery, bringing up a uh, rear guard that can actually not necessarily entrench, but they kind of have a higher ground and some remnants of really brief American fortifications maybe they reuse. So now this American division is coming up to Amer uh, British regulars and artillery that's waiting for them. And they just run into like a hail of canister shot, small arms fire, and take a lot of fire, take a lot of hits. Um, there are a number of pensions at this time of soldiers being wounded, shot. And it is Wor Worcester that as he's mounting a second horse, because his first one, at least his first one's been shot under him, as he's mounting his horse, he's shot um, allegedly by that loyalist uh, corps, which are acting as flankers in support of this infantry artillery Unit. So those American troops are taking a lot of fire and they, they break and fall back. There's one pension account that Worcester actually ordered a retreat, which is interesting. It would also account for a full retreat um, and not a resumption of combat that we know about. So that ends the fighting in the rear as far as we know. There's some accounts of these American troops making their way around towards now the south and the barricade and it's possible. I mean, there are some cannonballs that we've identified that have been really flung out there. And 
who knows how they got out there. One of them is in um, the Ridgefield Historical Society right now, and it's a four pound British ball, has war department marks, but it's way away from the combat. And, you know, how did it get there? There's even newspaper accounts and somebody finds it with a shovel. Um, it, it could be these American units, you know, trying to get around. Uh, the, without belaboring it, because I see it's about 1245, but just getting through the history and they'll opening up questions, comments, if you haven't you know, been sending them to the moderators already. Um, we, we are aware of the Battle of the Barricade. And long story short, it's like a three-phase action where the British first engage some American skirmishers in the front, which, you know, it's kind of standard practice and they fall back. But the British bring up six, all six of their guns, probably right on now kind of the Danbury Road, uh, North Salem, Bay Street intersection, and commence a cannonade, which is kind of ineffective, apparently. Um, only four pound ball, and I guess the barricade is relatively cannon proof, although the Sevens house is you know, getting punched up pretty good. The British sent heavy flanking units, as the Americans predicted, to try to turn the flanks. But as Sullivan mentions, like our, po our posts warmly received them and actually probably um, uh, those British forces fell back. I mean, it was a probing action. And then finally, the British are done messing around. They bring up all of probably Agnew's brigade that's in the front. And they have a 600-man column, which is described. But then other accounts mention the British attacking in a broad front talking to people that know more about the Revolutionary War in terms of combat and deployment than I do, it seems like it makes the most sense that the British just didn't charge with a 600-man column trying to punch through the line. They probably, A, would have done it immediately if they did or suffered significant casualties as the Americans would have just, you know, fired into their flanks and flayed because Americans had like a 150-yard front, like a pretty yard, pretty long front. So they probably came down in a column, deployed into a line and, and tried to meet the whole American line with their line, you know, standard, as we call them, like Napoleonic tactics today. And the battle went on for like a half hour, it appears from the accounts. So the Americans were able to hold their own. It was almost equal numbers. Americans had fortified positions as um, one American officer, I think, once stated, it might have been Israel Putnam, <laughs> talking about better Bunker Hill, like, American militia will fight all day if covered from the waist down, meaning if they have breastworks or fortification, it's a morale booster, right? So regulars don't have that, the British. So the British are taking hits, Americans are too, but the Americans are holding. Uh, it's not till apparently the Brit uh, American left flank is turned. Um, probably the 13th Connecticut was pushed back by possibly the Loyalist brigades, uh, Brown's Corps, all 300 of them. A platoon got up on these ledges. We're on the far end of this American barricade. And we're able to see probably the whole American line. And as most of them opened up on the American line, now shooting them not only from the front but the side, at least a dozen guys took aim at a prominent American officer, Benedict Arnold, that was within like 20 yards, 25 yards of them, opened up on him. His horse was hit something like you know, nine times and he was not, but pinned. One of these soldiers rushed to probably finish him off or take this high value target and Arnold let him get close enough so he could make sure he hit him with his pistol and he did and apparently got on another horse and probably tried to keep rallying American troops, but the American line was now broken. As the flank was turned on the left, the American troops are now peeling back from the Stebbins house, although not at a run. Apparently, they're keeping some order. There's interesting pensions to that account, uh, to that effect. But as Americans are now pushed to the, to the east towards this orchard, pretty close to where Ridgefield Historical Society sits today, um, one of the colonels of the 4th Connecticut, I don't have my map in front of me, was, was wounded and killed, Colonel Gould. Um, the 9th Connecticut on the Far East was the left to, last to fall back, according to pensions as well. So it's pretty clear that's how the, most of the line broke, almost in the direction of Ridgefield Historical and maybe East Ridge, if that's, if that's what that ridge is. Um, but now, as I'm muddling my way through and as I finish the story and as I'm trying to finish a report, and as historians have alluded to, and as artifacts have alluded to, there's a lot of fighting in town. All One only has to look at the Keeler Tavern to see a four-pound ball like embedded in a post still. 
But thanks to research by Ridgefield Historical, there's like another dozen to 15 cannonballs, uh, historical accounts, newspaper accounts, uh, contemporary you know, memory of my father dug up a cannonball here. Um, there's a lot of fighting throughout town. I have some maps I could show, if, you know, later at some point. If, um, But in any case, we're trying to figure out to what extent this fighting took place. And one of our metal detectorists who was working on his family property prior to Keeler, maybe even 100 yards before Keeler, has like 20 musket balls there. So, I mean, um, I think additional archaeology will clearly find these other actions that took place. And the British themselves, if, you know, rereading the accounts, mentioned the Americans held the village for a while. Then they gathered on some heights near the town. We tried to surround them, but they got away. And that's probably High Ridge, closer to New York. Um, with that said, the British camped on the south end of town, which would later become a racetrack. Now it's a, you know, um, kind of suburban kind of development. Uh, with relatively big yards, so there's probably a lot of potential there. And then the next day, the, um, the Monday the 28th, the British continue their march again towards the shore and enter the rest of the battle through Wilton and Saugatuck and Campo and everything that happens. So that's another challenge is some of these pensions talk about a lot of fighting at, you know during the Danbury raid, but some of them we can't include or I uh, can't make too much out of because it's not always clear if they're talking specifically about Ridgefield on the 27th or fighting afterwards. Uh, we're getting good at distinguishing between the two, but that, that's a challenge as well. There's basically four days of a campaign and three days of fighting, two days of significant fighting, many different units involved, lots of confusion trying to reconstruct the order of battle, at least on the American side. Um, but each one of these, you know, little counts helps build a bigger narrative. So with that said, um, yeah, we're in the home stretch of the, the, the technical report. Ridgefield will be seeing that soon. They'll be applying for phase two. And that's, that's this uh, Revolutionary War American uh, Battlefield Protection Program project we're working on. Um, a different sort of preservation. Um, but again, raising awareness to these, these threatened sites here in Connecticut and these very important national events you know that have taken place in our state but have been overshadowed by yeah you know new york boston other areas so we'll we'll, we'll work on that um i probably talked too much i'm turning it back over to jane and you know stacy and we'll just you know go from, go from there <clears throat> well thanks so much dave that was really fascinating um really fascinating the the three phases of the project the methodology of what you're you know embarking on and of course, your storytelling of the battles, it's really, really remarkable. And we're really um, so honored that we get like a, an early glimpse of everything that you've been able to discover. Mm -hmm. And as you're pulling everything together, this is a really special treat for us. And you know, we appreciate all of the work that the Ridgefield Historical Society has been doing. And it sounds like they're doing a lot of community engagement too, which is really terrific. Um, really well received, I think, from the community. Um, but I'd love to open it up to all of you out in the audience if you'd like to ask a question or a comment. And I don't see everyone. You can unmute yourself and ask a question or raise your hand. If you think of something later as well, feel free to contact Jane or Stacy. You could contact me directly through my email. Um, and, you know, love to talk about the battle more or if you are aware of some information that we should be aware of or if you've seen some artifacts that, you know, might be interesting. That, that's, that's all something myself and uh, Sharon Dunphy, uh, Dunphy over at uh, Ridgefield Historical would be interested in. <clears throat> Wonderful. Yep, so there was one question that came in the chat. Um, where were the skeletons found? <laughs> Yeah, well, they're found in Ridgefield. They're found in the vicinity of the third engagement barricade. Um, you know, confidentiality purposes. Obviously, we're not, you know, going to be able to give you an exact address, but and any historical account of the battle you read, contemporary, otherwise, um, there was a number of men killed in action there. Um, and the British controlled the battlefield. And after the battle, especially they probably, you know, reorganized their troops around there before they marched into town, another reason why the Americans would have some time to maybe make a stand here and there. Um, but either at that point or overnight, they, they buried some of their dead, which the British do. I mean, they 
the British army leaves every man behind, right? As soon as they're killed, like they, they bury them right there. It's all, that's what they do from, we're probably present day, right? Um, but in any case, yeah, there was, um, I, again, maybe half dozen skeletal remains found. There's historical accounts, to two or three burials. And, you know, for all we know, there's, there's more out there. I mean, I would suspect when the British encamped overnight, um, a number of men succumbed to their wounds. So there's a good chance there's people buried on the southern part of town, perhaps. Who knows? I mean, we're not looking for burials, but I mean, you don't know what you're going to find in these battlefield contexts. Um, so at any rate, anything else I can say about the analysis? I'm not doing the analysis on the bodies. You know, I've seen some research behind them. There's not any real identifiable buttons. These men may have been buried without any you know, real clothing actually may have been stripped. Um, whether they're American, loyalist, British, who knows? There's no identifiable buttons. One man has a jacket, probably another jacket was thrown across the length of the bodies. And that's about all we really know at this point. British carted, carted away a number of their wounded. Americans um, suspected that. The British discussed that. But anybody that did die, yeah, they were left on the battlefield. Americans even made claims that they found uh, remains, bones in the charred remains of the houses burnt in town. There was like a half dozen houses burnt in Ridgefield and barns and outbuildings. Typically the British burned any house. It was their strategy that they took fire from. So if Americans are shooting at them from a house, they try to surround the house and burn it down. That's pretty much what they do. So Silliman himself is speculating, did the British burn their own dead in, in these houses? Like, I don't think that's like a British practice, but you never know. And, uh, you know, in times of war, I guess. So, yeah, in any case, uh, Ridgefield's still working on that. I guess analysis is still taking place at Yale, and there's uh, hopes of trying to reinter the remains at least by the um, 245th anniversary, which is next year. So that's, that's like about as, all, as much as I can say about it, I suppose. <clears throat> Are you I hope finding that's all accurate, so. <laughs> <laughs> were you finding that there were, were conflicts in the reports between British papers and the American version? Oh, that's interesting. Um, uh, as Kevin and I have found, I think, throughout any of these projects, anything that often affer, uh, you know, appears to be a conflict or contradicting, it's too easy to be like, oh, yeah, somebody's wrong here, something is off. But what we often find, it's a matter of perspective. Right. For example, one commander's in the front, one's in the back. There's the, any, they only report on what they witness, right? So that's, that's always a, you know, interesting, you know, um, observation and it helps elaborate and unpacking different accounts. You'll get more out of the primary accounts if you can, you know, come to that, if you're able to, you know, connect those dots, it's not always possible. Um, what also was interesting, and I think, you know, the authors would probably also find is some of the time stamps. There's American accounts with talking about at nine o'clock, this happened. There's British accounts at eight o'clock, this happened. You know, Arnold says something about noon. A private soldier says something about uh, between one and two. There's all these different time accounts, which is interesting. And the more and more I go down that, you know, avenue of research and have been thinking about it with people that know more about it than me, um, there's a couple of things going on, which kind of kind of helped kind of crack a code for me. So long story short, I think General Silliman has a watch or has access to a watch. It's rare, but he's a general and he's got a staff, right? So all of his reports, he's got some good times. There's a British engineer who's clearly has a, a watch and a compass because he's also making maps. You need the two. His times are different too. Um, I think Benedict Arnold doesn't have a watch and is kind of guessing. And he's more concerned about just, you know, getting men where they need to be. And then the general, you know, everyday private soldier, farmer doesn't have a watch. They just know morning time, evening time, probably noon time. So the soldier saying, ah, between one and two, it makes a lot of sense. You know, maybe there was a church bell or something that went off earlier. So at least with the two other officers, the British, the American, there seems to always be kind of like about an hour difference. I got to check into this. And part of it is potentially explained by um, <laughs> there's actually a New York time versus Connecticut time, apparently, in the early colonial days. And it even goes back to some early Dutch stuff. So that's like a dissertation in itself, but that could be it. There's also naval time. The British are probably on naval time and it's kind of standard and it would differ a bit from the colonies. So in understanding that, and if I can 
compare a few more timestamps with everything else I'm doing and confirm that it, it'll make a lot more sense. Cause the British will say, we, we left Danbury at eight. We left it in flames. Silliman will say, we, we found out at nine that the British had left Danbury. Like, does it really take them an hour, you know, when they're surrounded and there's troops and spies everywhere keeping an eye on these red columns? Does it take them an hour to figure out it left, they left at nine, you know, they left at eight, they found out at nine? I think it's the time variance. And it, it also helps tighten up the third engagement where there's a lot of descriptions of time, but they don't quite coincide. So it's those kind of like weird questions that you don't realize till you try to like, break it down hour by hour. So that's interesting, I found. Yeah, so many fascinating elements to all of this. <laughs> well, we're certainly, certainly looking forward to your reports and upcoming uh, public programming that you may do. So we definitely want to stay in the loop on, on everything evolving with this project. And I appreciate you so much taking the time today to, to share all of this with us. Well, thank you. And I, I'd say the best way to do that is to get on the Richfield Historical Society website, get on their mailing list. There's going to be a lot going on between now and the anniversary next year, including a, a battle reenactment, which would be interesting. So so thanks again for the opportunity. And uh, if you need to get a hold of me, I'm, I'm sure Jane or uh, you know, Stacy can facilitate that. So thank you. Wonderful. We'll do that. Thank you so much, everyone. Hmm. So I'll stick around till I guess you know, it's us. And if you need anything else from me, otherwise I'll probably get going and back to work in a minute. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> get back to writing. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Is Michael still on? He had a question about an archaeology undergrad. Hi, I, I had a question about metal detectors and how much exploration people are doing using metal detectors. Metal detecting is the only way to complete these projects. It's, uh, it's been hard to, at early on in 2008-9 when we started these projects, to find a way to integrate metal detecting technology to that standard kind of grid you do for archaeology and shovel test pits and units and things like that. Many archaeologists are just really shy away from metal detecting because it really is rocket science. It takes a lot to learn. It's hard just to train up a staff member. Um, and also, if you don't understand or have a conception of how you tie it into your traditional archaeology, that's scary as well. Long story short, we relied heavily on local enthusiasts that had proved themselves to be good detectorists and good trustworthy people. There is a group in Connecticut called YTC, Yankee Territory Coin Shooters. The state police uses them. A lot of people use them for a lot of different work. So we contacted them and we found some great uh detectorists who, who focus really good in um, relic hunting in the woods and things like that. So yeah. long story short, we hired them and we helped all together build a methodology that when we uh, find an artifact, we flag it, we uncover it, very small hole, not like a huge unit or anything, uh, figure out what it is. And if it's related, then we, we take all our measurements and data and stuff like that, GPS it, and that's how easy it is that GPS coordinate that can then be tied to your conceptual grid um, that traditional archaeology relies on. If you need to open a unit or a shovel test pit, you have your grid as well. So you can plop a unit with GPS and space, pull out your meter tape. And it's, it's a really great, quick system. Um, with that said, um, metal detectors are depending on skill and model and everything, are usually effective to about a foot in the ground. But believe it or not, most of our battlefield objects, even from King Philip's War, Pequot War, 17th century, most of these artifacts, most bullets are only found, like we're talking centimeters, like about, you know, six to 12 centimeters, a few inches. So they don't move a lot unless there's plow zones or trees, you know, moving things and earth moving. Metal detecting has been done as a hobby by people since after World War II, really. Um, so a lot of areas have been detected, but what we have found is not everything is, is removed or, or, or recovered. I mean, even, even 
our team going to the same Pequot War battlefield, we still go to the same battlefield sites, I swear, that we've been we have access to that we've been going to for five, six, eight years, we still find artifacts because you just don't ever get it all. There's too many factors. Park Service doesn't want you to find anything, everything, I should say, because if you find everything, you don't have a battlefield to protect anymore, right? So you're yeah. supposed to get enough to make the point that something happened here. We try to get as much as we can, but we always know that we, we clearly didn't get it all. But in any case, right. um, we, we, we rely exclusively on metal detectorists. There's no point of laying out a grid doing test pits. You would never find your, your site. We've proven this back at Mash and Tucket as well, like just by in 17th century sites, um, uh, doing a shovel test pits like archeologists do. We didn't find too much. We go back with metal detectors. We found all kinds of objects that you know clearly just weren't there um, in the grid that we laid out. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I mean, yeah, if you no, have- it does. Thank you very much. It was a great, great talk. Thanks, for that. thanks. Yeah, you'll see us in action maybe in like a year from now. So wonderful. Super. Well, thanks so much again. Thank you very much. Um, have a good rest of your day. You too. All right. Bye, everybody. Care. Thank Bye you. Now. Bye. Bye now.